you know, we live in a time where access to the Bible is at an all-time high. For instance, this morning there are people living in Houston, Texas who are watching a church service in Charlotte, North Carolina. There's probably somebody in Miami, Florida watching a church service in Seattle, Washington. You can go to YouTube and find any sermon that you want by basically any preacher that you want. And this is a great gift that we have in the 21st century. But it also comes with a great caution. Because YouTube is not filtering the biblical faithfulness of whichever sermons are put on their platform. Whatever podcast service you use is not discerning whether or not the preachers and the teachers that you listen to are faithfully teaching the Bible. In our text today, John is challenging the community that he's writing to to test the spirits. Whether you know it or not, every single person in this room who is a member of this church has an active role in the sermon. You are not simply passive listeners. You are active listeners, meaning that you are to take what it is that the preacher delivers to you and determine for yourself if it aligns with the truth of God's Word. You should take any sermon that you hear from me or from anyone else and make sure that what is being taught faithfully aligns with the Scripture. As a preacher, I'm just telling you, It is not that difficult to take a passage of Scripture and go off into left field and push whatever agenda you want to. It's not hard to do. Preachers are trained to speak for a living. They can do it. It's also not hard to take a passage of Scripture and interpret it wrongly and lead those that are listening to you to think that this is the way the Scripture is supposed to be interpreted. So part of your job as the body of Christ is to take the teaching that you hear each week and make sure it is faithful. Where do we get that model, that example from in the text? The best example of this, I think, comes from Acts chapter 17 with Paul and Silas. As they go into Berea, they go to the synagogue to teach there. And in verse 11, here's what Luke tells us. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica, which is where they had just left. They received the word with eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So the Bereans provide a great example for all of us. We should be doing this, as I said, with any teaching time that you hear, examining it to see if it aligns with the scriptures. No human teacher, no human preacher is immune to error. It could be an instance where the preacher simply misspoke, or it could be that what he is preaching is in fact not biblical. So as I tell you all the time, I get so encouraged when a brother or sister calls me Monday or Tuesday and seeks clarification on what I said in a sermon. That does not hurt my feelings. That is not discouraging. That is encouraging for two reasons. Number one, it means that they're paying attention and not sleeping. But number two, it also means that they are taking the scriptures and making sure that what the preacher says aligns with what the preacher is saying. So just know that every single week you gather for this moment when the preacher delivers the word of God, you have a participatory role in the service. You are an active listener, examining the teaching to make sure that it aligns with the whole counsel of God. So as we work our way through this passage today, number one, we're going to learn to test the spirits. Number two, use Jesus as the guide, and then number three, trace its origins. Test the spirits, use Jesus as the guide, trace its origins. So number one, test the spirits. John addresses these Christians as beloved. This is the fourth time out of six that he uses this phrase to describe the people that he's writing to. John is not talking about the Holy Spirit when he says, test the spirits. He's talking about testing 
the teaching of anyone who would claim that they are speaking on behalf of God. And this doesn't happen a lot within the Baptist denomination, but in some dom- denominations there are times when someone might have a prophetic word that they want to share with the congregation. Now, most of the time, these are filtered through pastors who then determine whether or not this prophetic word can be shared with the congregation. And that's very wise because what we don't want is someone coming up and saying, I have a word to share with the congregation, and then we find out after they shared it that what they shared is not biblical or would contradict the teaching of Scripture, right? So you always want to be able to filter any type of prophetic word that a person might have that's assuming you still believe that those gifts of the spirits exist, which is a whole other issue that we'll not talk about this morning. But that does happen in many denominations. What's most important, when anyone has a prophetic word to share, whether it be a church member or whether it be the preacher, that it aligns with the teaching of God's Word. Sometimes in those moments, people might say things that they mean with good intentions, but clearly do not align with the faithful teaching of God's Word. And as we have said, everyone in the church has a role to guard the teaching of the church closely, even if it's the primary responsibilities of the pastors and the elders. So in John's context... We know that false teaching was taking place. And these prophetic utterances were being delivered to the congregation, but the messages were going against what had been passed down from Jesus to the apostles and then to the church that John is writing to. So if you go back to the very beginning of 1 John, which we have done many, many times, John reminds us what this faithful apostolic message is he says that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the father and was made manifest to us so John is alerting the people in this letter that many false prophets have gone out into the world. And Jesus himself, in his earthly ministry, warns his followers of the same thing. In Matthew chapter 17, verse, excuse me, Matthew 7, verse 15, Jesus says these very words, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So most false prophets in Jesus' day, as well as in our day, are not noticeably false prophets. Think about it. How many false prophets do you know that introduce themselves as false prophets? They're plastering it across the front of their church. This is where false prophets preach. No one does that. No false prophets believe that they're false prophets. They think that they are faithfully teaching the word of God, but they're not because their teaching does not faithfully align with the word of God. A deviation from orthodox, faithful, historic Christian teaching is often a slow fade rather than an abrupt jolt. When we think about the many leaders in the prosperity gospel movement, for example, people like Benny Hinn, T.D. Jakes, Joe Osteen, Kenneth Copeland. None of these men are claiming on their broadcasts that they are false prophets. And they also, none of them, abandon the Bible completely. It's the same way with leaders in progressive Christianity. Like Rob Bell, Brian McLaurin, Jen Hatmaker, these people. They're not abandoning the Bible completely. But instead, as you dig into their teaching, they have a very low view of Christ. They focus on moralism rather than salvation. And they have a low view of sin. Now, Michael Kruger is a New Testament professor at Reformed Theological Seminary. He's done a lot of work 
on studying the prosperity gospel and progressive Christianity. And he has this quote in one of his articles that he wrote on it. He says this in reference to progressive Christianity. He says, if you don't have a divine Jesus, and if you reduce it all to moralism, and there's no real fall or sin, then the cross isn't really anything that saves you. When you look at the cross... It's just a good example of a good person. It's not really good news. That's what's really sad, he says, about progressive Christianity. At the end of the day, it's not really good news at all. It's really that it's all up to you. And if it's all up to us, he says, that's bad news. But of course, the real gospel is good news. That it's all done and completed in the great and finished work of Christ. So as you consume all of the Christian teaching that is out there, you need to be looking for people that faithfully talk about sin, the holiness of God, the atoning death of Jesus for sin, but also those that faithfully teach that God is gracious merciful, loving. He is both of those things. He is all of those things. So if I come across a brother or sister who comes to visit me distraught over sin in their life, number one, I want to affirm that and say, praise God that His Holy Spirit has convicted you of that sin. That is a good, healthy indicator that they're on the right track. But if they're struggling with feeling guilt and shame over their sin, I want to come in and edify them by talking about the grace of God and the mercy of God and the love of God that he has for his children, even though they might be struggling with sin. But if on the flip side, somebody comes to me and they want to just talk about God's grace and God's love and God's mercy all of the time without ever making the connection that the reason they can rejoice over God's sin, over God's grace, mercy, and love is because of what? Their sin. These all go together. So we do not want to isolate one extreme of who God is for the sake of another. And this is what often happens. In progressive Christianity, this is what often happens in prosperity gospel teaching. So we want to test the spirits. Every single preacher that you listen to, myself included, no one is immune to error. The only one who is not immune to error is God. And he has faithfully revealed a perfect and holy book, the Bible, that we test Every single preacher and teacher against. So when I tell you to take this sermon today, go home and see if it aligns with the Word of God, that is not me just saying it because I'm supposed to say it in this sermon. I actually want you to do it. No preacher is perfect. No preacher is immune to misspeaking or wrongly understanding something. Now it could be, you take this sermon home today, you disagree with me, we come and have a meeting, we go to the text, and we just, for whatever reason, we don't seem to understand that text the same. Now assuming that it's not something like, you know, Jesus dying on the cross or the resurrection, which are not up for debate, don't even waste your time bringing that up to me, all right? I'm not going to argue with you over that. But if it is something that maybe there is room for disagreement over, which happens, there are going to be some of us in this room who have different views on what we would call secondary and tertiary matters of the faith. Those would be the second level, third level issues that should not break down Christians having fellowship with one another. Those are some of the issues that we might disagree over, but we can still say, you know what? I happen to believe that the Scripture is faithfully teaching this. You happen to believe that the Scriptures are faithfully teaching this. So we're going to love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, but just know that 
at the current moment, we're not seeing eye to eye on whatever that issue must be. So we always, number one, want to test the spirits. That is what John is telling the congregations that he's writing to in this passage to do. Test the spirits. Every single prophetic utterance, John is saying, that comes before you, make sure it is faithful to the message that has been handed down to you from Jesus to the apostles and now to you. And then number two, use Jesus as the guide. So we want to test the spirits, then use Jesus as the guide. We have been in this letter long enough to know the issues that were happening in these churches. These false teachers were claiming that Jesus was not God in the flesh, and they were claiming that they were without sin. Thus, Jesus becomes the guide to determine whether or not the Spirit is of God. Look at verses 2 and 3. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is, he says, the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. So the teachers in John's day believed that Jesus Christ came in the flesh... But he was not from God. These are what these false teachers were believing. And in response, these true Christians responded to that teaching about Jesus by staying faithful to the message that had been handed down to them. Have you ever read the Sermon on the Mount before? Specifically in chapter 5, where Jesus is essentially saying in this part of the Sermon on the Mount that everyone who has ever been angry or has ever lusted after someone that's not their spouse is a murderer and an adulterer. That's very convicting, right? We all fall short of this. So sometimes when we hear the faithful teaching of God's word, here's the deal. We might not leave feeling good about ourselves. We might feel convicted. We might feel challenged. We might feel like the only hope we have as we leave today is pleading the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's exactly how we should feel all of the time. Pleading for the blood of Jesus to save us from our sins. So many of these false teachers were pumping up the church to believe things that were not true and to make them feel good about those things that were not true. And John is coming in and reminding them, if you say you have no sin... You deceive yourselves, and the truth is not in you. That's challenging. That's convicting, right? Not what people want to hear. But John knows that conviction and truth always has to trump someone leaving feeling great and good about themselves. Now, I freely admit, you know this about me, I do not consider myself to be a chief encourager. My bent my, in my mind, I work more black and white. I am more prone to preach for conviction oftentimes than I am encouragement. And by God's grace, in his work of sanctification, I hope he grows me into being a far more uh, encouraging person than I sometimes can be. But we need both in the church. We don't just need one. We need both preaching for conviction and preaching for encouragement. But in the context of John's letter, you have to feel the weight of his discussion about the seriousness of sin. The sins of Christians matter because it hinders our communion with God. The sins of non-Christians matter because it leads them to hell, apart from repentance and faith in Christ. So in contrast to true teaching that focuses on Jesus coming in the flesh, being sent from God. These false teachers were claiming Jesus is not God in the flesh. And John calls this spirit the spirit of the Antichrist. And we talked about this some in chapters 1 and 2. But remember, there's capital A Antichrist, and then there's lots of lowercase Antichrists. And in chapter 4, John is referring to the lowercase antichrists. This would be anyone who is spewing false teaching. 
that Jesus did not come as God in the flesh, and that it is possible to be a Christian and not uh, have sin in your life. So in this epistle, most of the time, John is talking about the lowercase a antichrists. The spirit of the antichrist in John's community was represented not in a single individual, but in a whole group of people who were deceiving Christians into thinking things that were not accurate, that had not been passed down from Jesus to the apostles and then to them. So in verse 4, what does John do? He encourages the faithful brothers and sisters. He says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. Talking about the false teachers. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So as John continues to warn the Christians, he also wants to remind them by encouraging them that they have up to this point remained true to the gospel and that they did not follow these false teachers. So how have they been able to overcome the false teaching? It's because the Holy Spirit is at work in them, enabling them to reject this false teaching. We know that the role of the Holy Spirit, according to John 15, John 16, John 17, is that of helper. The Holy Spirit is our helper. He is the one who can help us discern between true teaching and false teaching. The Holy Spirit will not lead you down a path that would be contrary to the teachings of Scripture. This is so important. That when people tell us they've received a message from God or they they want to share a message that the Lord has given them and we hear it out and we realize that what that person is saying is not biblical whatsoever. And it's hard in that moment to tell that brother or sister, I'm not so sure about that. But this is why we have the Holy Spirit to help us discern the difference between a true word from the Lord and a false word from the Lord. Now, this does not mean that as you hear someone preach that the Holy Spirit is just magically going to sprinkle dust over you to let you know that what is being shared is false teaching or true teaching. You know how the Holy Spirit helps you in that moment? The Holy Spirit is letting you know that, by the way, as I help you, you need to know what God's Word says. So there is no, like, express pass that you can take And just think that the Holy Spirit is just automatically going to tell you what is true and what is false. No, you have to get into God's Word. And as you get into God's Word and you learn more about what is true and what is false, the Holy Spirit will illuminate your heart to remind you of those things. So your reading of God's Word and how the Holy Spirit helps you discern true and false teaching go together. You can't never pick up your Bible and expect the Holy Spirit to just whop on you in that moment that yes, you're listening to a false teacher or yes, you're listening to a true teacher. You have to study God's Word. You have to know theology. You have to delight in doctrine as we've been doing these last six to eight weeks and we conclude tonight at four o'clock. Shameless plug for delight in doctrine. I had this situation happen in our own church a couple of weeks ago where a brother in Christ reached out to me and asked if I had heard of a particular teacher out there. I had not, but a quick search popped up the fact that this individual teacher had a lot of red flags. Now, the question is, how did this brother know that the teacher that he was investigating was a false teacher? Well, one was an, a big giveaway. He was closely related and associated with Joel Osteen. That's always a big red flag. But number two, I happen to know this brother well enough to know that he is faithfully in God's word day in and day out. And over the course of his life, as he is sanctified in Christ, the Holy Spirit has helped him to discern what is true and what is right. And as he investigated this teacher, he had a pause in his spirit about what was being taught. This didn't happen because the Holy Spirit just magically sprinkled dust on him. 
It's because he's faithfully studied his Bible over the course of 30, 40, maybe 50 years. And the more we consume God's word, the more it seeps into us. Even if we don't ever memorize whole books of the Bible, the more you expose yourself to God's word, the more the Holy Spirit can help you discern between true and false teaching. So there is never a substitute for just faithfully reading God's word day in and day out. So we use Jesus as the guide. Any teaching that would stray from the message that Jesus passed down to his apostles and then passed down to John and all of the others, which was then passed down to the church throughout history and has now been passed down to us. Any message that would deviate from what John tells us in the very first chapter of this letter, we should classify as false teaching. But number three, we always want to trace the origins of any teaching. Look at verses 5 and 6. Here's how John describes these teachers. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world. And, this should not be surprising, the world listens to them. We, however, are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and error. The false teachers in John's day and in our day, they are of the world. And because they are of the world, it implies that they are not of Christ. Even if they are ignorant of the deception which they teach, which, by the way, many false teachers are, as we said earlier, none of them think that they're false teachers. So they're ignorant of their own deception. They are not intentionally trying to lead people away from Christ. They believe many times that the teaching that they teach would classify them as true teachers. So it should come as no surprise then that the world would be interested in false teaching since what describes these false teachers is in fact the world. So lost people will easily be attracted to messaging that goes against the gospel. Why would they be that way? Because many times it's the very message that lost people want to hear. So they're attracted to that. See, lost people respond favorably many times to false teaching. And false teachers can quickly gain a following because they tell lost people what they want to hear. Here's how this plays itself out. Hypothetically, I could preach shorter sermons strictly in the Gospels, never discuss any of the challenging, complex books of the Old Testament, like Leviticus, Judges, you name it, the books that just really confuse us and scare us. We could talk about political issues and current events and get people excited about those things. We could never mention sin, the holiness of God, the wrath of God, the judgment of God. We could exclusively emphasize God's love, God's grace, God's justice, God's mercy. Those are all true things, but we don't want to just exclusively talk about those things. And you know what would happen if we did that? We might have more people come. We, we might be able to create a following. Not because of anything I'm saying, but simply because the message is what people want to hear. And if we did that for a while and we sold out to that, we might grow numerically. And if the goal of our church was to attract a large quantity of people with a false gospel, I'm fully convinced we could do it. Because we have lots of smart people in this church. And we could brand things a certain way, and our messaging could be so creative that lots and lots of people would come, perhaps. But they would not be hearing the truth of the gospel. So what we have to do is opt for a different way. So week in and week out, we try to 
faithfully teach the whole counsel of God, it was not always fun to bring to you the book of Judges every Sunday. I didn't wake up all those Sundays and just jump for joy that we were in Judges 6 learning about a dude getting his head chopped off. That's not always an appealing message that people want to hear. But we want to faithfully teach the whole counsel of God and allow the Holy Spirit to do His work at His rate of changing our hearts to be more in line with Christ. We try to sing songs that are theologically rich. So it might not be at the tempo or the style that everyone wants. But the theological richness of what we sing with our mouth is far more important than the melody of the song itself. We're going to emphasize the the weekly gathering until you get so tired of me talking about it, and then I'll continue to talk about it. About how important that is. We will sin and fall short of God's glory, but we will regularly confess our sin as a church. We'll stumble and we'll falter as we figure out what new ministries to promote, what old ministries do we need to let go. The pastors will fail you. We will forget to call you. We will forget to visit you when you're in the hospital. We will make bad decisions that were painfully obvious to everyone but us that what we were about to do is a bad decision. We will do all of those things. And by God's grace, hopefully... You will remember in those moments that you aren't at the church for your own personal preferences or a specific song or a specific program or ministry. You are primarily at the church to feast on the Word of God and communion and celebrate baptism and be in fellowship with other believers who know your strengths and your weaknesses and your warts and all. And yet, for whatever reason, they still love you and care for you. And by doing those things, we hope, by God's grace, that we will know God and His Word better and we will be able to better defend ourselves against false teaching that is out there. So trace the origins means, does the teaching that is faithfully expounded week in and week out here or any other church, does it take you back to Jesus and the faithful message he passed on to his followers? Many of you are familiar with Christopher Hitchens. He was a very prominent atheist. He passed away about a decade ago. He was part of the new atheist movement with Richard Dawkins and many others. And he was interviewed before he died by a lady who classified herself as a liberal Christian. And what she meant by that was that she did not believe in the atonement, that is the the death of Christ, and that she didn't believe the scriptures should be taken all that seriously. And as she interviewed Hitchens, she was thinking by communicating this that maybe he would be able to identify more with her since she's not a a conservative, fundamental Christian. She's a more liberal Christian. And in the interview, here's what Christopher Hitchens said in his response to that. He said, I would say that if you don't believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ and the Messiah, and that he rose again from the dead, and by his sacrifice our sins are forgiven, you're really not in any meaningful sense a Christian. This is coming from a man who does not believe in God. He thinks it's completely made up. He is an apologist or was an apologist for atheism, trying to draw people out of Christianity to believe that it's all a hoax. And he is telling her, okay, let me get this straight. You say you're a Christian, but you don't believe in any of the key tenets of what it means to be a Christian. Basically, he tells her, based on what you've told me, you're not a liberal Christian. You're not a Christian. An atheist who wants nothing to do with Christianity is telling her this. And I have to say, 
as much as I obviously disagree with Christopher Hitchens on lots of things, he is 100% spot on in his answer to this interviewer's question. As we begin Holy Week today and as we celebrate it all week long, please hear me. If Jesus did not actually die on a cross and did not actually come back from the dead, then we are all wasting our time. There is no need in practicing Christianity as a ritual if you do not actually believe that Jesus died and rose for your sins. In fact, this would not be very pastoral of me, but in some ways I would rather you not come until the Holy Spirit could convince you otherwise. You're not impressing anyone by gathering here every Sunday morning out of respect for cultural Christianity or out of respect for ritual religion if you do not actually believe the teachings in this book. So, Christians, my challenge to you, get into God's Word and trust the Holy Spirit to guide you as you discern true and false teaching. Progressive Christianity on one side, prosperity gospel on the other side are not biblical Christianity. Non-Christians, which I know we have some here today, the only faithful gospel teaching is one that urges you to repent of your sin and place your faith in Christ alone for salvation. That is the gospel. Not because I say it, but because God's word says it from Genesis to Revelation. The whole counsel of God teaches that man could only be made right with God through believing in faith and repenting of sin. So do that today. Let's pray together. God, we are in desperate need of your Spirit to guide us and direct us. As we listen to sermons and read books and watch TV shows, spirituality is everywhere around us. We live in a very spiritual time. But we need your Spirit to help us discern true and false teaching. So give us a passion and a hunger for your Word so that your spirit can help us discern. And we thank you for the faithful example that John gives us in this text, reminding his readers to test the spirits. May we do the same as a church. May everyone in this room do the same with this sermon today. They would be active listeners participating in this time, making sure that what is taught not only from the stage, but in every single community group and every single Bible study that we have, that it is faithful to the teachings of your word. So show us more about you and your nature and your character as we study this great book together. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.